Our session is entitled Justice, Statecraft, and Modern Science. My name is William Hurlbut. I'm a, a professor in the Department of Neurobiology at Stanford University Medical Center. Uh, I guess I was asked to moderate this panel because I, I uh, am a physician. I teach courses in biomedical ethics, and I've served on the President's Council on Bioethics. Um, I know Carter Sneed for that reason. So we have a subject that, that um, is full of, of implications of controversy and potential conflicts. Uh, science is increasingly challenging in its implications for what sources of authority to accept for um, major issues relating to justice in questions of the priority of topics of research and the way research is conducted. Um, science has major implications for our, for the actual reconceiving of notions of justice and of course many practical implications for the, its science's interpretation and application in evidence in matter, matters of jurisprudence. So we have a very broad, very important subject, a very modern subject, and we have three excellent presenters. I'm going to give very brief introductions, turn it over to the speakers, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end of the session for discussion. So our first speaker is Philip R. Sloan, Emeritus Professor from the Program of Liberal Studies in Notre Dame's Great Books Program and the Graduate Program in History and Philosophy of Science. He was originally trained in evolutionary biology at the Scripps Institute of Ocean Oceanography, where he worked on the biology of the of deep sea and photosynthesis research, but he actually turned his studies toward even deeper and um, more nourishing focus, which was a history of science, um, where he got his, did his doctoral work. He's been active in the, the John R. Riley Center for Science and Technology. He's a professor here at Notre Dame active in the John R. Riley Science, Technology, and Values program since its founding. He served as the director of that program. And uh, he's been also been fellow and past chair of, of Section L of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has held office on the Governing Council of the History of Science Society. He was a lay advisor to the National Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Science and Human Values. Uh, for eight years. That's where I first met Phil. And um, his research specializes on the history of philosophy of life science from the early modern period to the contemporary uh, molecular biology. I, I know Phil from quite a few interactions and, very, and have very high respect for his, his scholarly groundings and very thoughtful uh, understanding the human issues of um, science, technology, and society. Phil. Well, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to address uh, the conference on this very big issue of, of uh, not only of justice and, uh, modern, and modern science in this session. And in addressing the topic uh, of this session, uh, devoted to the interactions of modern science with politics and justice, I'm going to narrow my focus on two conceptual developments in the science of the 19th century, both of which have considerable relevance to uh, discussions of uh, distributive justice. This gives us a brief outline. The first is the theory of the conservation of force, or later, later terminology, the conservation of energy. <clears throat> and the second is the post-Darwinian conception of a dynamic system of nature that leads us into modern ecology and the notion of an ecosystem. These two concepts, energy conservation and ecosystem, developed separately in the middle decades of the 19th century, but now interact in many ways in contemporary science. First, energy conservation, a principle given nearly simultaneously, if different formulations in the 1830s and 40s by at least a dozen people. 
This fourth great conservation principle following the principles of the conservation of momentum, charge, and mass generally expressed the claim that various forms of energy, mechanical, luminous, chemical, physiological, and electrical, were interconvertible with one another, and moreover, in the most uh, developed formulations, are quantitatively conserved. For the themes of this paper, I will concentrate on physiological developments, particularly by the German physiologist and later leading physicist Hermann von Helmholtz. Originally trained as a physician, Helmholtz initially dealt with this issue as a problem of medical physiology. Generally put, the problem was how to understand organic life and its apparent autonomous character in relation to underlying physical and chemical causation. Reigning physiological theory into the 1840s assumed the autonomy of the living state through the governance of organic action by special, uh, special force of life, which was the causal explanation of key organic processes such as embryonic development, nutrition, organic synthesis, and the special character of organic compounds. Life, in other words, was not considered to be reducible to chemical and physical causes. Through experimental work with new instruments and techniques that made it possible to perform precise experiments on isolated tissues, Helmholtz was able to show that the expenditure of chemical energy could be equated quantitatively with heat and chemical and, and mechanical action generated by an isolated muscle. This was seen by Helmholtz and some of the others in this uh, slide here as uh, they were pursuing similar works as eliminating the claims of a special force of life. Instead, there was a quantitative interconvertibility and in conservation of chemical, mechanical, and biological forces. Helmholtz's subsequent mathematical exp exploration of this principle led in, uh, to the generalized statement of the principle of the conservation of force in an 1847 paper that forms a landmark in the history of science. It enunciated the principle that the total force within a set of relations is conserved and expended in quantitative ways. This claim also supported a rigorous framework for generalizing the uh, principle to cover a global system of conservation relationships between the sun, earth, and environment, as Helmholtz sketched out a comprehensive picture of the interrelations of solar energy, plant physiology, animal nutrition, and respiration standing in a dynamic relation with an ultimate source of force uh, in the sun uh, that is in, expended in quantifiable ways in the warming of the atmosphere, the currents of the ocean, in chemical reaction, physiological functions, heat production, and light. As this bears on the issues that concern distributive justice within the social order, the principle sketched out here by Helmholtz and others had other consequences. It provided a scientific warrant for what seemed to be the claim that quantifiable relations held between food, muscle, mechanical force, and labor in a rationalized system of economics and manufacture. Stephen Blackpool's lament to Mr. Bounderby in Dickens' Hard Times that he is considered to be just muscle and energy sustained by a minimum quantity of food and wages, a being without hopes and emotions, captures a principle that Marx was later to develop in his critique of capitalist economics. Humans can be reduced in such a system to quantifiable instruments in a ruthless system of commodity production and exchange relations. This general, this general principle also has additional implications for our thinking about the interrelations of science and social justice. It implies that there is no free lunch in the system of relations of economics, labor, resource utilization, and environment. Utilization of force or energy in one area of the planet, whether this is in the production of goods or in the exploitation of natural resources, must be paid for and paid for in quantitative equivalents through transformations of one form of energy into the other. Our first world prosperity is not without cost. It's just being paid for elsewhere, either in our own environmental degradation or increasingly in the third and fourth worlds, where we can see today images of human exploitation, poverty, food scarcity, and environmental degradation akin to that once in evidence in Midlands 19th century England. 
The second key development is the concept of a biological ecosystem. This emerges historically from the natural historical sciences rather than the physical and physiological. The claim that there is an interconnected set of relationships of organic beings has had a long history and was given an influential formulation in treatises by the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus in the 18th century under the name of the economy of nature. This economy viewed nature as a divinely designed order of species interactions. In this order, organisms all fall into a proper place in the system regulated in their numbers and participating in a rational system of exchange and balance that attains a teleological end with human good, the ultimate goal. Predation, struggle, and death all occur, but, without the purpose, but with the purpose of maintaining the overall providential economy of the system. Charles Darwin was intimately familiar with these texts and drew upon this tradition of the economy of nature in the development of his evolutionary theory. But in his interpretation, it was transformed into something novel. In chapter three of The Origin of Species, the famous struggle for existence chapter, Darwin developed the fundamental dynamic principle behind his theory of evolutionary change. What drives the system toward increasing complexity and species diversification as we move through geological history? For this dynamic principle, Darwin drew, as is well known, on the claims of the British political economist Thomas Malthus. Malthus had outlined the consequences of a claim disparity between food and space on one hand and the tendency to geometrical population increase of the human species on the other. In Darwin's hand, this principle was generalized and transformed into something else. Even though he speaks of employing the doctrine of Malthus, it is now this doctrine, quotes, applied with manifold force to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms, unquote. In other words, it would also apply to the food supply, itself organic, as well as those consuming it. All living beings, and not just human beings, are involved in this incessant drive to overproduce. The consequence of this for Darwin's theory was to move the interactions to a higher level from limitations imposed by food and space on individual organisms to limitations imposed by one species interacting with others in a dynamic system of controls and balances. This new Darwinian economy of nature is a system governed by the imminent balancing of species in a, in a, a mutual struggle for existence resulting from the impetus provided by the population principle. The resultant image of nature is not that of a harmonious and providential order, but that of what he said to quote, a yielding service with 10,000 sharp wedges packed close together and driven inward by incessant blows, sometimes one wedge being struck, then another with greater force. Darwin's economy is a secular system with struggle, extinction, and famine and death awaiting the looser, forcing each species more and more tightly into its place in this dynamic system, and leading at least some successful forms with appropriate variation to undergo gradual species change in response to the changes in these external conditions of life. If there is a balance of nature, it is one maintained only by internal interactions between species, not by external design. Historians of ecology have viewed Darwin's work as the great watershed that separates early forms, uh, ideas of the divinely ordered economy of nature from what was subsequently named by the German uh, zoologist Ernst Haeckel as, as ecology. And in the 1935s, we also then had to introduce the term of uh, ecosystem to, to discuss this. Now to turn to the second part of my lecture, if the historical developments I have outlined are recognized for the importance I feel they should have, there are some implications for human life, for just relations of peoples, and for a theistically based view of human beings and their inherent dignity. Energy considerations and the recognition of the dynamics within ecosystems give a scientific warrant for the conclusions that we may also draw from other sources for the claim that we are in a system of mutual responsibilities to one another globally 
and also to natural resources and to the environment. This global and systematic interdependence of peoples has been gradually recognized in church social teachings and in the major Catholic social encyclicals of Popes John XXIII, Paul VI, and John Paul II. In the words of uh, John Paul II, Christians have the moral obligation, according to the degree of each one's responsibility, to take into consideration in personal decisions and decisions of government this relationship of universality, this interdependence which exists between their conduct and the poverty and underdevelopment of so many millions of peoples. What the sciences have added to this moral prescription is a causal understanding of how these elements interact that makes this claim of interrelation more than a religiously based ethical choice. The recognition of ourselves as positioned within a dynamic ecosystem with different trophic levels and food chains that can be disturbed and altered in negative ways gives us a means of understanding how human actions can affect the larger biotic community. We now see more clearly how energetic relations involved in the interaction of sun, atmosphere, water, and earth that Helmholtz had briefly sketched out in the 19th century can affect human beings adversely, as we've seen dramatically in the recent experiment, experience with Hurricane Sandy. The recognition, uh, in giving full recognition to the principles, uh, I claim there's a fundamental contribution of the natural sciences to our reflections on the development of a just world order and the solidarity of peoples that forms part of a Catholic philosophical anthropology. Science has given us precise ways to understand the nutritional needs of people, water and pollution, and interaction of in, in climate and land. But there are also negative consequences of these scientific developments. Human beings are not merely components of energetic systems or members of ecosystems. We also want to assert some kind of human uniqueness and warrant for special consideration in the natural order that has over a long history been captured by the concept of dignitas humani, human dignity. In the debates that have occurred in the last, century, uh, last decade over this issue and what has been termed by some the dignity wars, what has been at issue is the claim that there is a fundamental obligation to respect human beings as moral creatures deserving of special consideration and at all stages of life. This claim is typically grounded upon the recognition of human beings as possessed of rationality, deliberation, freedom of choice, properties that are claimed to be inherent in every human being, even if not exercised. As this point was put in a recent paper by legal philosopher um, Robert George and, philosoph and philosopher Patrick Lee, possession of full moral worth offers, fo follows upon being a certain type of entity or substance namely a substance with a rational nature. Since basic rights are, be are grounded on being such a certain type of substance, it follows that having a substantial nature qualifies one as having full moral worth, basic rights, and equal personal dignity. Lee and George present these claims in contrast to a biocentric view that underlies the arguments of strong animal rights advocates, utilitarian ethical calculus of human worth, exemplified by the arguments of such people as Peter Singer. But how are we to connect these arguments with the scientific developments I've outlined in this paper? We're faced today with, in the life sciences with a dramatic conjunction of biophysics, evolutionary biology, molecular genetics, neuroscience, ecological science, and biotechnology, which in their interactions have now achieved a remarkable control over life in all stages. Philosophically, these developments have also carried with them a profound tendency to naturalize human beings to entities within a secular system of relations. Both energy conservation and Darwinian evolution have contributed to this naturalization in many important ways. What is urgently needed, uh, I feel, is serious reflection on the means to sustain claims for human dignity in the face of the reductionisms of much of contemporary life science. Unless this is addressed, we are left with a rational disconnect between what might be the conclusions of a theistic philosophical anthropology and the world of the natural sciences. We have abundant evidence of this disconnection in conflicts about the nature of human life, 
over the moral status of human embryos, over teleological interpretations of human existence, and generally over the claims of transcendence of human beings over nature and other forms of life. I can offer only in, in this limited time but just a few preliminary suggestions of possible ways forward. Most fundamentally, we require deeper reflection, I feel, about how the understanding of a human being possessed of rationality and free will is relevant to the claims of the sciences themselves. Too often, it seems, such issues are ignored in the deliverances of the reductionisms of, offered by the life sciences. Life sciences, in particular, offer, often exemplify in their methodology a close affinity to what Edmund Husserl characterized as a natural attitude, the attitude of everyday life that precedes a reflective philosophical level of thinking. This pre-critical stance to the world we can see evident in many areas of life science, and it becomes increasingly problematic as scientific rationality is then turned upon human beings in such enterprises as social biology, evolutionary psychology, and cognitive neuroscience that offer us very various forms of reduction of the human to the natural. Pope John the Paul, uh, II, in his important 1996 letter on evolution, spoke of the need to recognize an ontological leap in our understanding of human beings, while at the same time expressing openness to the claims of evolutionary biology. But exactly how this difference is to be understood is a point that needs considerably more reflection and intellectual labor. Some opening in this direction has been suggested to me by returning to the insights of the original phenomenological movement and the implications of taking seriously the givenness of the reflective self, consciousness, and intentionality that underpin this movement. I suggest that we have perspectives from this tradition that provide ways of seeing ourselves both as part of nature and at the same time as transcending in ways crucial to our moral and theological reflections. This does not place us in opposition to the developments in natural science, but it moves us to consideration of human questions at a new level of reflective discourse that connects with the theological and traditional uh, philosophical reflections on human beings. In conclusion, I urge a new level of dialogue between the natural sciences, philosophy, and theology that is fully cognizant of the developments of science, but that can also give us a robust basis for a concept of human dignity, and with this, the necessary foundations for a just social order. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. You gave us a good foundation for beginning this discussion. Our next speaker is um, Don Howard, who is going to speak to us um, on the subject of science, scientific evidence and moral values. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's science and democracy. There we go. Sorry. So Don Howard is professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame here, as well as the dir director of the John J. Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values. He received his PhD from Boston University. Professor Howard's area of interest include the philosophy of science, foundations of physics, history of philosophy of science, and the Ethics of Science and Technology. Um, he's um, published many books and articles in the area, areas including most recently The Challenge of the Social and the Pressure of Practice, Science and Values Revisited. Uh, Don Howard is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Thank you very much, Bill, for the kind introduction. I wanted to start also by thanking Carter and his colleagues in the Center for Ethics and Culture uh, for organizing this wonderful uh, conference. And if I might just add one little personal note, uh, our Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values uh, cohabitates with the Center for Ethics and Culture on the fourth floor of Geddes Hall. You're all invited to drop by for a visit. Uh, uh, we're really happy to have uh, CEC as neighbors. Uh, just one other word about the Riley Center, as the name says, Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values, our distinctive charge is to promote the conversation about the value dimensions of science and technology. 
Uh, it's important that a center with that mission be situated on a Catholic campus of this kind. Uh, this is a distinctively Catholic way, I think, of appreciating the place of science and technology uh, in human, uh, human experience. Uh, and I invite you to visit our webpage and look at the many programs and initiatives that we uh, uh, have um, within our purview. Anyway, as uh, Bill said, I wanted to talk about science and democracy uh, today. Uh, it'll take me a moment to get there, so please bear with me. Uh, let me also say right at the beginning that uh, I will speak about this uh, mainly from the point of view of a philosopher of science, leaving it to Phil and my history colleagues to provide real historical depth uh, to, the, to the consideration of these issues. Um, let me begin here. The scientist is a human being with a psychology and a biology. Scientists work in communities. Communities have sociologies. Science has a culture. Cultures have anthropologies. Science as a form of practice is historically situated. Um, my colleagues in the philosophy of science spent the better part of a decade inventing a lot of tools uh, for denying the import of those plain facts about what science is what scientists are, what scientific communities are. It's important that I rehearse a little bit of that history and debates about that history in order to get us to a point where we can have a genuinely productive conversation about a topic like science and democracy. So three distinctions that my philosophy of science colleagues uh, uh, developed over the 20th century uh, are responsible for a lot of mischief in making these conversations harder than they should be. Uh, one of these goes back to 1938 and the work of the logical positivist Hans Reichenbach, who set up a distinction between what he called the context of discovery and the context of justification for the purpose of collecting together under the heading context of discovery Everything having to do with the history of science, the psychology of scientists, all contingent facts about the culture of science, so on and so forth, handing responsibility for those questions over to the historian, the sociologist, the psychologist, and reserving for the philosopher all and only those questions of an allegedly purely epistemic sort that live in what he called the context of justification, as if to suggest that everything that is important about science as a way of knowing is untouched by all of those mundane human, uh, human uh, facts. A second and closely related distinction that has also done a lot of mischief dates from the 1960s and the reaction to Kuhn. I'll say a word about Kuhn in a moment. And that is the distinction between what we now call epistemic and non-epistemic values. This reflects a grudging admission uh, in the 1960s that values might play a role in the way science is done, but that we can still neatly segregate the epistemic from the non-epistemic values. So the epistemic values are the so-called truth-inducing values, uh, such as perhaps simplicity, meaning that if you choose among competing theories on the basis of simplicity considerations, that might be conducive to the truth. Non-epistemic values is the term used to designate all other value considerations, well, like considerations about human justice, perhaps. And again, this for the purpose of putting that in a separate category, allegedly having nothing to do with science as a way of knowing. A third distinction that did a lot of mischief is the distinction between pure and applied science, as if there were a totally detached form of inquiry revelatory of the most bas basic truths about nature, that the scientists' pursuit of that truth had nothing to do with questions of how we would use that truth if and when we discover uh, that, uh, that truth. I want to come back to that distinction specifically in a moment, if I might. Um, it took a lot of hard work to begin to challenge some of that dogma. Uh, it was one of the achievements of philosophy of science in the post-war period. Uh, thanks especially to the work of, of philosophers and historians of science like Thomas, uh, Thomas Kuhn, of course. Uh, but a lion's share of the credit for helping us to think our way out of the predicament into which we had argued ourselves at an earlier era 
a lion's share of the credit for this goes to feminist philosophers of science. It's partly thanks to the fact that they occupied a marginal position in our discipline for a long time that they were capable of a kind of heresy that couldn't live within the mainstream of the community. Happily, a lot of that heresy has now become mainstream within the philosophy of science. We have challenged all of those uh, distinctions in deep and fundamental, uh, fundamental ways. One of the chief legacies of the work uh, that was undertaken by our feminist colleagues, but then by many other scholars coming at this of many other kinds of interests, one of many achievements of this work was to create for us a space within which we could begin to think about science and science as a way of knowing from the point of view of the social and political organization of science. So let me give you one example and let me cite one crucial text. Uh, Helen Longino is the feminist philosopher of science whose work I chiefly prize in this domain, whose 1980s book, Science as Social Knowledge, probably did more than any other single work to begin to open up our thinking about these questions. One of the central points that Helen makes in that book is that the topic of scientific objectivity should not be seen as a purely epistemic problem, but should be seen as, in part, a question about the social organization of science, and beyond that, then, the political organization of science. It becomes, in part, literally a question about who deserves a seat at the table when we are involved in scientific controversies of one kind or another. Part of the achievement of that book is her developing many examples that showed how uh, granting a seat at the table to previously disenfranchised groups for, in part, purely political reasons, in the end was conducive to our doing better science in those, uh, in, in those domains. Some of these examples are really rather mundane, but they're being mundane you know, gives them force. So think about the fact that for a long time when we did trials, clinical trials of new pharmaceuticals, we didn't stop to think about the fact that the population in which you did the trial should be made up representatively of women and men. I mean, this sounds incredible to say this, uh, say this now, but for a long period, those groups on which clinical trials were done were predominantly constituted uh, out of male subjects, as if the idea never occurred to anyone that women might respond differently to certain kinds of pharmaceuticals. Having challenged that for political reasons, we're now doing better biomedical, uh, biomedical science. Well, anyway, thanks to the work of Kuhn, thanks to the work of our feminist colleagues, a space opened up in which we can start thinking more seriously about the genuine human dimensions of science as part of what it is to do science. So I now want to turn and talk a little bit about the kind of work that is now being done in the space that was opened up, uh, uh, opened up in, that, uh, uh, in, that, uh, in, in, in that fashion. Um, the subject of science in democracy has, within the past 10 years or so, uh, become a rather large subject uh, in the literature on the philosophy of science. Let me again advertise a really important book that helped to facilitate this transition. And this is Phil Kitcher's book from about 10 years ago, titled Science, Truth, and Democracy. It's really the first serious attempt by a, a distinguished philosopher of science to begin asking some hard questions about po how politics and science talk uh, to one another. I don't want to go on at great length about Phil's book in particular. I do want to register a certain dissent on one point. Part of his achievement is to try to get the philosophers of science and the political theorists talking to one another. One of the problems, in my mind, with this particular exercise in this direction is that the political theory that he brings to this task is basically Rawlsian liberal political theory. And there are many of us who are becoming active in this area who think that that's thin gruel, if I can use that metaphor, that that's not a, an apparatus of political theory that is really adequate to the task of theorizing, especially the notion of interest, 
gender interest, class interest, national interest, so on and so forth, that should be a part of that, uh, of that conversation. That dissent aside, nonetheless, this has been a hugely important book uh, in uh, bringing new problems to the forefront of the agenda in the philosophy of science. Now, what are some of those problems that Phil has encouraged us uh, to think about? Uh, prominent among those problems is the question of citizen participation in science policy making. Let me slow down now and talk about a couple of specific issues in this arena. Let me first uh, begin this by uh, invoking yet another distinction, but this one, one that is helpful for organizing our thinking. We commonly now make a distinction between what we call policy for science and science in policy. Let me talk about examples of citizen participation that fall under both of those headings. I'm not going to defend a view of my own here, uh, but I am, what I want to do is put some important problems on the table in front of us for further uh, discussion. So first, let's think about the question of policy for science. Uh, I would bet that many of you don't know that we are at the moment witnessing a major shift in the way in which we think about such things as the place of the National Science Foundation uh, in the administration and funding of, of science. Uh, when the science, National Science Foundation was established back in the 1950s, the concept that informed it was in no small measure that old distinction I mentioned between pure and applied science. And the mission that was given to the National Science Foundation back at that time was the promotion of pure, basic scientific research. What would flow from that eventually that might or might not be beneficial to humankind, that was not a question that fell within the purview of the National Science Foundation. For bluntly political reasons, that understanding of the role of the National Science Foundation, and likewise the roles of other major funding agencies like the National Institutes of Health, uh, that has begun to shift under pressure from Congress. There is now much greater emphasis uh, within the National Science Foundation on what previously we would have called applied research, or rather research that will more immediately and in clearer ways yield a direct benefit for the common, uh, for the common good. Uh, well and good, one might say. I'm myself quite happy with this, this transition. I'm interested, however, in the question, and I invite you to think through this question, of how we make decisions of that kind. Through what kind of political process do we make decisions of that kind? Many scientists react very strongly negatively toward what's happening. They resent what they see as nothing but political interference in setting the agenda of science. Their argument is that scientific expertise alone is relevant to deciding what ought to be the questions at the forefront of the research agenda. What kinds of projects ought to get the bulk of the funding? Clearly, the US Congress thinks differently about who has a voice in the conversation about how we will spend those scarce federal uh, research dollars. Um, one of the problems, however, is that you give the public, you give a Congress, you give a legislature too much latitude and leeway in domains like this, and bad things can happen. Let me illustrate that with an anecdote. I began my career in 1978 in the philosophy department at the University of Kentucky. A big shock to me when I arrived on that campus was finding that one of the most beautiful buildings on campus uh, was this monstrous building that had as its uh, name, boldly emblazoned on the face of the building, the Tobacco and Health Research Institute. This had been created by the Kentucky legislature. It was funded by a penny a pack tax on all cigarettes sold in the state. 
it was given a mission by the legislature brazenly of doing science in service of proving that tobacco, uh, cigarette smoking didn't really seriously affect human health. Well, as you might imagine, a lot of very bad science went on in that, in, uh, that, that institution. That's a good case study in how this can go badly off the rails if scientific expertise isn't given its proper role in deciding what the research agenda should be. On the other hand, don't we think that the public does have a voice in deciding how research dollars are to be spent? Who is then to mediate that public voice? Let's shift to another arena. Let's talk about the role of science in policy, and let's spend just a few minutes talking about the example that is, of course, on everyone's minds these days, and that is the question of global climate change and what the role of the public is in the science of global uh, climate, uh, climate change. Uh, it hardly needs to be said that there are many compelling questions about justice in this region, in, in this arena. Uh, it's a point commonly made that many of the people most at risk for uh, problems such as sea level rise tend, for reason, accidental reasons of history and geography, tend to be poor and brown peoples all around, uh, all around uh, uh, the world. Um, as you all know, this is a highly contested arena of science right now. Uh, there's, let me editorialize a little bit here, there's a whole industry that has grown up to try to cultivate an impression of scientific dissensus around the fundamentals of climate change, when in fact within the relevant scientific communities, uh, it, we've rarely seen consensus of the kind that we do have about the fundamental facts of climate change itself being a real phenomenon and about its being anthropogenic uh, in origin. Uh, still, there are really big and hard questions here about how we move forward, uh, given those basic, uh, those, basic, uh, th those basic facts. Who gets a seat at the table in trying to decide how to promote, how, to pro how, to, how further to pursue the science, what kind of science to fund, how to use what we're learning uh, from this science to make, uh, uh, to make, uh, to make policy. Uh, clearly, scientific expertise has a role to play. Clearly, economic interests have a role to play. There are huge costs attached to some of the responses that are contemplated for global climate change. Clearly, the affected peoples have a role to play in, in uh, all of this. But let me oversimplify the problem just for the sake of simplicity and making it, making, it, making it clear. I don't want Joe the plumber making policy uh, in the arena of global climate change. Uh, I think that there's a pl a, an appropriate place for scientific expertise. On the other hand, I very definitely want Joe the plumber to be part of the conversation about how we are going to deal with that, uh, with that problem. Now the tough problem is figuring out what are the political structures, what are the administrative structures through which we will achieve the appropriate balance between scientific expertise and public, uh, public input. These are really hard problems. We're a long way away from solving those problems. Let me conclude now with just a couple of words about one other question that has recently become of real interest to me in this, uh, uh, in this arena. And I'll once again advertise a book that I think is well worth your reading. This by the political theorist uh, Mark Brown, and it is entitled Science in Democracy. Uh, one of the things that Mark talks about in this book is that the history of science and the history of political theory actually have a much more intimate connection than most of us grew up thinking they did. You can find these connections in many places. One that's of special interest to Mark and of special interest to me, and it's a connection that bears directly back on the very questions I just posed to you about the appropriate mode of citizen participation in policy making in and for uh, science. One of the questions he's intensely interested in is the notion of representation. And he tells a fascinating story about how the idea of representation in the philosophy of science, that is the idea that theory represents nature, grew up hand in hand 
with the notion of representation in political theory, the idea that in some manner the sovereign or the legislature or whatever represents political interest. Uh, okay, what do we learn from that? Well, one really interesting question is this. It seems as though in the early modern period, in both of these traditions, the idea early took root that representation is in one important sense a kind of passive affair. That is to say, over in the philosophy of science, you have nature that just stands there by itself, and then you have theory that reflects this antecedently well-formed nature that science is seeking to describe. Analogously, the idea took root that there is something like, call it the public interest, that is antecedently well-formed, independently of any political process, and that the point of the political process is simply to reflect in a true fashion, an adequate fashion, what that political interest uh, is. One of the questions Mark wants to foreground is whether that's a bit naive on both sides, whether the idea of there simply being an antecedently formed reality that scientific theory reflects and whether there's an antecedently well-formed interest that politics reflects, whether both of those need to be examined. Just I'll conclude with just this suggestion that Mark makes over on the side of political theory, which I find a very interesting one, and that is the idea that perhaps the point of the political process is not simply to mirror interest, but is instead to construct the public interest or to construct the public good. Take that back then to these questions about how science lives in democracy. Maybe one of the roles that science has to play is in helping the public to figure out what is the public good in the first place? What is in the interest of the, uh, of the public? I'm running out of my time here. I promise to be brief. I will stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Our final speaker is Lorenza Violini. She's a professor of constitutional law at the School of Law, University of Milan. She is trained in the United States and Germany. She's published studies on environmental law, on the problems connected with the relationships among the different levels of government, on federalism and regionalism. During the academic year 1992 through 1993, she was conferred the qualification of Jean Monnet Professor, if I pronounce that right. <laughs> That's uh, since she included in her um, institutional courses a special section devoted to the problem of European integration from the Italian constitutional law point of view. Together with these teachings, with these teaching innovations, her scientific interests are focusing on the legal system of the European community, complicated matters. Um, Okay. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a great pleasure for me to be at Notre Dame for the first time, and I'm really honored to speak here at this Congress organized by the Center for Culture and Ethics, and I deeply thank my friend Carter Sneed to have invited me to speak. So my presentation aims to offer a European perspective on legal controversies over bioethical questions characterized by intersections between law and science. This is a narrower perspective compared to the more general discussion we have heard about on the relationships between science, law, democracy, and philosophy. Though narrow, the topic may be of interest since it has to do with the very essence of the human being, or quoting the German philosopher Speemann, with the difference between someone and something. In the past decades, there has been a great deal of discussion on bioethical questions. In a world characterized by radical diversity in moral and political practice, such questions require decisions that are difficult to justify solely on the basis of normative principles. This is one of the reasons why public bodies look to various forms of scientific support. On the other hand, scientific progress creates new moral challenges for lawmakers and courts. <clears throat> 
Put simply, at present, ethical and legal issues must be informed by science. Science, in turn, by challenging existing legal and ethical values, must be governed by normative principles. The links between science and law in the realm of judicial review of bioethical questions have been highlighted long ago. Those studies I had reached already the conclusion that a more reflective alliance should emerge between science and law, between the search of, for truth and the search for justice. In recent times, other studies have, characterized, uh, have criticized the model of maximal deference to science, uh, stressing the need of a dialogue, as we have heard previously by Phil Philip Sloan. So considering the alternative between deference and alliance, what is the model of relationship between science and law in European case law? In order to answer to this question, I will analyze three sets of, ca three set of cases, two decided by the European Court of Human Rights and, and one decided by the European Court of Justice. Before analyzing the cases, let me give you a short overview on how the European Court of Human Rights deals with scientific uncertainties in bioethics. When dealing, dealing with such controversial issues, international courts in general tend to rely on evidence provided by experts. There is no dispute about the legitimacy and rationality of this kind of decision-making process, but for various reasons, many scholars have warned the court against the, the risk of an overestimation of scientific evidence against and against its allure of objectivity. Aware of this risk, the European Court of Human Rights, Rights adopts the judicial doctrine of margin of appreciation, which leaves member states free to exercise their political power by virtue of the democratic legitimacy they have acquired through popular vote. Moreover, since the content of the convention rights must evolve in line with legal, social, and scientific progress, the margin of appreciation is sometimes, but not always, narrowed by the notion of consensus. If there is a wide consensus among, among member states on those issues, the margin can be restricted. So against this background, let us start analyzing one of the most discussed ethical issues, the abortion case law. In, the cases, in cases related to the matter, the European Court of Human Rights has granted to national parliaments a wide margin of appreciation because the judges perceive, I quote, scientific and legal uncertainty related to the beginning of life. Accordingly, in the court's view, it is up to the states to balance the rights of the mother and the protection of the unborn child. Such principle seems to be adequate. But in fact, at a closer glance, it leaves one of the parties of the balance, the right of the unborn child, with an undefined European protection, maybe not even existing European protection. As a result, the Convention protects the, protects the, the women's right to life, ex Article 2, and privacy, ex Article 8, but, it, but seems to leave any protection of the unborn to the discretion of the states. The judicial trend emphasizing the rights of women may be identified in several cases. In the most recent one, the case A, B, and C versus Ireland, the European Court of Human Rights held that the Irish legal system banning abortion except in case of danger to the life of the mother was to be considered against the convention because it did not include specific legislation providing a process by which women could seek an abortion for the sake of preserving their lives. Legislation aiming to comply with the European judgment is currently being examined in that state. 
and if enacted, this legislation might have the side effect of, of weakening the Irish constitutional ban on abortion by allowing doctors to invoke the exception in a broad array of circumstances. This, uh, I would also like to make a comparison with the abortion jurisprudence in the USA, but I will skip this part due to time constraints. We can discuss it later on. Um, while the case of abortion uh, links science and law in a very superficial way, in the case of artificial procreation, the relationship between scientific and legal matter is considered in light of the need for the national parliaments to change laws according to the scientific progress. I will consider two recent European decisions uh, and the connections with the decision made by the Italian Constitutional Court. So put in the, in the slide the, the, mm, the cases. First of all, so in, in 1992, the Austrian parliament decided to allow homologous fertilization, but strongly restricted the access of heterologous fertilization. Two infertile, cap infertile couples in Austria complained about this law, alleging a violation of their rights, enshrined in Article 8 and 14. In uh, 2009, in 2009, the first section of the court held that, I quote, since the use of IVF treatment gives rise to sensitive moral and ethical issues against the background of fast-moving medical and scientific development, and since the question raised by the case touch on areas where there is no clear common ground among the states, a margin of appreciation was to be granted to Austria. However, the court observed, once the decision to admit artificial fertilization had been taken by the state, the legal framework governing it could be tested on discriminatory grounds. And after this test, the court held that the Austrian law did not conform to the convention. Two years later, the Grand Chamber reversed the judgment, restoring the margin of appreciation afforded to the, con afforded to the contracting states. It is worth noting that the judgment absolves Austria, stating that its legislation was correct for the past historical moment in which it was enacted. But it points out that the legislative framework of uh, states, of the e European states, and scientific progress have deeply changed. Thus, Aus Austria was strongly warned to consider modifying its law. So it is not easy facing these judgments to find out what is the EC real position in such matter. Does it state that the prohibition of heterologous fertilization is still accepted in light of the convention, or that the need to change law should prevail? This ambiguity gave rise to many disputes at the national level. In Italy, for instance, in uh, 2010, Due to the influence of the first judgment of the European Court, several lower courts challenged the Italian legislation, arguing its incompatibility with the Convention as it forbids heterologous fertilization at all. In, two, uh, in 2012, uh, so very recently, the, our Constitutional Court dismissed the case on procedural grounds. Since, it, the grand since the Grand Chamber decision had been released in the meantime. But this solution has been strongly criticized by the opponents of the Italian restrictive regulation on fertilization. According to them, the court should have struck down the prohibition of heterologous fertilization by entering in a thorough medical and legal inquiry 
as it did, in fact, in a precedent dating back in 2009. In that case, in case decided in 2009, when deciding on another article of the Italian very restrictive law on artificial procreation, the court struck down the requirement that only three embryos should be created at a time, and all of them be, to be implanted in order to avoid creoconservation that was prohibited by law. The court noted that the parliament should have taken into account the scientific state of the art. Granting deference to the expertise of doctors, the court held that, uh, that the woman's right to health implies that doctors needed to be free to decide what would be the best interest of the woman without being bound to legislative limits. So the two examples uh, show from the Italian Constitutional Court to show in my view, show in my view that the national litigation is strongly affected by decisions taken at European level, despite the presence of a margin of appreciation. And secondly, that the national prohibition of heterologous fertilization is in danger of being struck down, since the judgment, the Constitutional Court of judgment the latest, uh, the, the, the judgment of 2012, is an exception dismissed on procedural ground. The rule being that the court usually defers to a scientific expertise when facing so-called scientific issues. But in this case, it, the, the decision of the legislator was a moral decision, an ethical decision, not a scientific decision. And so the court tend to hide its decision and, uh, beneath scientific issues, whereas uh, it really decides over an ethical question. So, uh, had we, we have seen uh, the approach of the European Court of Human Rights seem to be rather ambiguous in the field of scientific issues present, present in legal cases. Scientific and legal uncertainties are acknowledged, but the scientific side of the problem is not dealt with in depth. In contrast to this approach, the European Court of Justice of the European Union has adopted a more activist attitude in scientific matters. A very recent case on patentability of uh, stem cell lines shows uh, this uh, uh, trend. So in Europe, um, national patent laws are now harmonized by virtue of international agreements and by a directive, uh, directive number 9844 whose Article 6 to C prohibits the uses, the prohibits to patent invention, inventions that use human embryos. However, this directive does not define the term embryo. The interpretation of Article 6 to C came before the Court of Justice when the Federal Court of Germany requested its legal opinion on whether the exclusion of patentability of human embryos covers all stages of life from the very fertilization of the ovum. According to the court, the protection of human dignity specifically required by the directive um, excuse me, um, necessitates a broad definition of human embryo. Therefore, the term embryo shall entail a fertilized egg, a non-fertilized human ovum in which the cell nucleus from, from a mature human cell has been transplanted, <clears throat> as a non-fertilized human ovum, ovum whose division and further development has been stimulated by parthenogenesis, as all of three are capable of commencing the process of human development. Again, uh, as to the ability to patent the procedure which allows neural precursor 
precursor cells to be obtained from stem cells, the court held that an invention cannot be patented where the process requires the prior destruction of human embryos. Even though the court expressly pointed out that it was not addressing questions of medical or ethical nature, the final decision was clearly a decision on a highly disputed scientific and legal matter made in the name of the protection of human dignity, so a normative decision. To get to that result, in fact, the court ignored statements in favor of such patents from the European Commission and from several European countries. So it's not easy so to summarize all these cases and uh, to get to a conclusion of my analysis. However, it seems to me that in the abortion case, uh, European judges consider unsettled scientific issues strictly connected to legal disparities among member states. Judges do not analyze the two separately. They do not use each element's specific methodology. They gave equal weight to scientific issues and to legal disparities as if they were one unique entity. In so doing, judges run the risk of providing solutions to the controversy that are ultimately unsatisfactory. A similar conclusion can be drawn from the case on heterologous procreation. The judgment of the Grand Chamber, so the second judgment, though apparently in favor of the member states, suggests that parliaments, in Europe in general, consider growing consensus on these procedures and the scientific progress in the area. Here again, the reference to science and to its progress remains highly generic without any consideration of alternatives or minority scientific opinions on the issue, not to mention the moral side of the question. Progress in artificial procreation techniques when connected with a growing legislative consensus to them caused any limitation to artificial procreation to become automatically a suspect one. And as a consequence, not surprisingly, in countries where on ethical grounds those limitations are enacted, national courts have to face continuous challenges to such, such legislation based on European case law whose reasoning is neither clear nor convincing. The European Court of Justice present a slightly different, a maybe more interesting approach to scientific issues. The court directly addresses the scientific and morally disputed issues, issue of patenting stem cell lines by grounding their decision within their power to interpret European legislation. The court's clear definition of embryo, whether agreed with or not, opened a wide discussion on the issue, allowing majority and minority opinions to confront one another in the European public square. This, this seems to me a more definitive and therefore democratic way to cope with all the ethical and scientific challenges that biotechnology and its process, progress continue to raise. It's worth noting, nonetheless, that the judges still avoid, avoid entering in a true scientific discussion. I began my speech with a plea that law and science form a more reflective alliance. At present, European judges still struggle to define what legal framework should govern complex bioethical issues. Therefore, we must keep uh, the conversation and discussion on the science, the law, moral values, and their alliance open with the awareness that there is uh, still a long way to go. Thank you for our attention. <laughs> oh, <not to> <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much. Three really, really interesting and very different and broad um, inputs on our conversation. So science, statecraft, justice, what made to many of our, our fellow citizens seem like a fairly simple matter of finding the facts and just applying them, turns out to be a very complicated subject, doesn't it? Influenced by, by a whole range of interpretations of theory, different cultures, uh, and the basic complexity of the fundamental questions of how this, we even arrive at objective scientific facts. We have, uh, our session is, is, has filled the time, but I don't see any reason why we can't stay for a little discussion since lunch doesn't start till noon anyway. So I will, we'll just go for a few minutes here. I, I think um, maybe the first thing I'd like to do is ask the, the panelists if they have questions for each other. We'll take a couple questions that way and then we'll turn it over to the, to the audience to ask questions. Any questions from within the panel? Or, com or comments on one another's papers? I, I would just, uh, one, one uh, comment here, because we had a lot of reference in uh, uh, Professor Violini's uh, paper, but it was on what is the input of the sciences into this discussion? You say scientific expertise, the courts are, uh, is this asking for empirical data from the sciences about complicated questions like when does life begin? Is this the kind of thing that no. we're talking about is the input of? Okay. No, my, my point is exactly this, the lack of a real uh, dialogue between judges and scientists when they have to decide such uh, complex uh, problematic issues. Judges tend to ignore science or simply to say, there is a scientific uncertainty, so wide margin of appreciation, and then maybe control strongly what states are doing, this at European level. Uh, on the issue of um, pat patenting, you know, there is a huge discussion in Europe going on because, uh, due to the st strong uh, uh, impact that those decisions are mm -hmm. having on the development of industry. So there, uh, maybe the judges don't say that they listen to scientists, but they do uh, unofficially, uh, they listen to testimony and so on. But when you just read the cases, it's really amazing. And struck me very strongly that they simply say scientific discussion, scientific problem, problems, but don't, they don't even try to enter a little mm. bit more deeply in, in the issues. Okay, questions from, yes. I'd like to, I'd like to ask Professor Violini uh, on this question of in vitro fertilization. Uh, I noticed that they were worried about the destruction of human cells uh, in in vitro fertilization since it takes sometimes three, four, five attempts to achieve uh, a baby. Uh, what happens to spare cells? Well, two or three things, they can be destroyed or they can be distributed for scientific research or suppose they could be saved for some woman who needs them. Uh, I noticed that they didn't have uh, very strong disapproval somewhere of, what, what are your views on this issue? Okay. Now when you said cells, you're talking about human embryos. Human right. embryos. Yeah. I, I, so, what, what are your opinions on what should be done with the embryos? Okay, uh, well, I pretty much conform to the uh, decision taken by the uh, European uh, Court of Justice, because I think it's a very restrictive decision, but very ethically very, very good decision. What the, it seems to me that is lacking, it's the attempt to deepen a li little bit the scientific reasons why those ethical questions are decided. Because there are, I'm, I'm convinced, uh, very good scientific reasons to say that uh, if you start uh, a process, uh, what starts the process is someone and not something. Because uh, when, when, when is the point where you really s say when something becomes someone? Okay? We, we can discuss for, for a long time about this issue, but rationality and scientifically, you should really uh, give also scientific good reasons to make those ethical and legal choices. Otherwise, they will always be unconvincing and uh, 
you know, a little bit soft uh, and maybe ideologically too. Just to follow up on that, you said that the, the um, rulings were that there would be a very broad definition of the human and you included the activation of an unfertilized egg. Can you just explain to our audience why that was included? Oh, okay. Uh, the legal reason why the court included even non-fertilized eggs, but eggs that were put to, uh, to start the process, uh, was very simple in that case. They just said, uh, since the directive protect, protects human dignity, so we will adopt a broad uh, understanding of, uh, of of embryos, uh, very broad, uh, and they surely pick up something from the scientific literature uh, saying this. And um, and I think I think they did a, they did a good job. In fact, I in my view they should have also clarified which were the basis of their decision in in that in that uh, in that case. This would have avoided uh, a lot of uh, discussion and problems. And I think. Uh, personally, I'm convinced that when some, when uh, the the uh, the egg starts to uh, develop, then there you should simply see that this process is not going to be is going to create a human being. The process. I'm very interested in in the idea of the process. Start. When you say an egg starts, you mean an unfertilized egg or a fertilized egg? Uh, there's, well, a, there's no such thing as a fertilized egg, of course, it's an embryo. But, but what, when you say that, are you including an activated egg that's unfertilized? That's, I think this okay. is a, something that can consider the first stage of development of a human being, the full human being. <clears throat> I think so. The reason I bring this up is because this is an example of an issue that where scientific evidence can contribute to our thinking about it. And the reason the court is being very careful on this is probably because in very, very rare cases, an activated egg will show some, some degree of organized development. But it's very brief, and there's never been a case even, a, I think, of an implantation, um, a successful implantation. Of, so this raises very fundamental questions that need to be addressed. Um, obviously, we owe justice to that which we define as a human being, but there also is the question of are there minimal um, potentials that define what a human being is? Yep. May I add briefly, Carter, may I have something? In fact, uh, one of, maybe from a legal point of view, one of the reasons why they, they were so cautious is because of the bright use of the precautionary principle in European legal system, even in biotechnologies and so on. So this is, gave a legal basis for them. And besides, the, there is another issue which I haven't mentioned in my talk. It's the, 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 the court did not decide decide on the um, nature of pluripotent stem cells. Because uh, the advocate general, if both, uh, simply advocated the, uh, the ability to patent such cells. Because they say there is no evidence that they can develop in a full human being. But the court, at, at that point, the court said, no, we have to to leave decisions to the member states because uh, there is no clear evidence that pluripotent stem cell can really develop in, in, uh, in, uh, in a full human being. But there is a lot of discussion on the issue among uh, legal scholars and legal uh, and uh, science, science. And there is a group of German scholars that really is against this idea because they say totipotent potent cell and pluripotent cell are so unknown that we should stop, uh, stop. we should not stop uh, making research on this issue. Excuse me. No, no problem. Thank you, Bill. Just to, as a point of clarification for, for, for the audience, the three definitions, the three alternative definitions that Lorenzo was discussing look very much like the definition of embryo in American law in the, in the Dickey Amendment, which is an appropriations rider to the federal omnibus funding bill for the entire federal government. 
which describes embryos as the product of fertilization. Embryos is the product. The second was a reference, I think, to somatic cell nuclear transfer. That is the product of cloning, which, of course, there's never been a baby that's been born as, uh, that, that we know of from that process. And the third, parthenotes, which you all were just discussing, namely parthenogenesis. And, and the reason that those that capacious definition was adopted in American law was just out of an abundance of caution. The idea that we want to cover every, anticipate possible, even though even if we doubt the, the, the efficacy of those methods. My question's for Don. Um, how, how do we, um, as a cultural matter, I mean, so science enjoys enormous social capital, and rightly so, because of its extraordinary contributions to human society and human flourishing. How do we sort of um, enculturate the, the view that, that I, I heard you suggest, which is to say science is extraordinarily useful. We should, however, uh, you know, we should delineate expertise in scientific matters from citizenship kinds of questions, questions of who should be deciding questions of value. What's one thing to ask about, for example, you gave the example of global warming. Is global warming man-made? You know, that seems like a scientific question that experts should have pride of place in resolving. But then the question was, how do we deal with the results that they, they give us? How do we, how do we sort of um, enculturate the, 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 the virtue of policing the boundaries between those two different kinds of competencies in a culture that venerates science, like the American culture? Well, perhaps one emphasis in my talk didn't come through clearly enough, and that is that I'm generally skeptical of, uh, of hasty uh, flights to easy distinctions here. And one of the distinctions I would want to challenge is whether or not there is the boundary there between scientific expertise and uh, sort of citizen participation. Uh, I'm rather enamored, I use it all the more all the time, of this expression, uh, citizen scientist and scientist citizen. Uh, you know, I think a, a, a better view is one that just sees a continuum of, uh, of different kinds of competencies and different kinds of claims to participation in different kinds of uh, discussions. Uh, I'm impressed by cases where otherwise, where citizens who might have been deemed utterly incompetent uh, have actually manifested extraordinary competence that was directly relevant to a policy issue. I'll give you another example from my Kentucky years that still stays with me. Uh, I worked in Lexington, Kentucky, which was only about 12 miles as the crow flies from one of the U.S. Army's major repositories of nerve gas. And back in the uh, early 1990s, we made a policy decision to begin uh, getting rid of this stuff. And the question was, do you ship it to one central uh, incineration site, there was a place proposed in Utah, or do you do it in situ? Well, ours happened to be the area where we had the densest population around any of these uh, repositories. The Army at first wanted to just burn it right, uh, right there, hauled out tons of experts, you know, you know, gave the risk, cost benefit, risk analysis, you know, tried to calm the public, nah, nothing's ever going to happen here. Thought they were just going to ride roughshod over local community feelings about the inherent dangers of doing this. And it was an extraordinary moment when this community just found within itself technical resources or technical abilities and technical sophistication that you wouldn't have looked for in shopkeepers and lawyers and you know so on and so forth and in the end there was a crucial hearing where the science that the community brought to the table beat the science that the army brought to the table it was a it was a very instructive case study uh, yeah now that's an interesting case because what was crucial there was that it was not just uh, the raw expression of unsophisticated citizen opinion about this, what was required for that to happen as it did was that the citizenry set about very deliberately to make itself expert up to the point it could in the relevant science. Uh, that's one of many possibilities in this space we don't often enough think about, and that is, and then of course we are educators, one of the things we should be asking ourselves is how do we train students here at Notre Dame, not so that they're all, they don't all emerge here as molecular biologists and particle physicists and so forth, but train them in such a way so that when they find themselves in that sufficient situation, they have the toolkit necessary to do what those people did, and that is learn what you need to know in order to become credible participations, participants, even on the technical side of that conversation. I think we do a, reason, a rather poor job of preparing our students for those kinds of citizen responsibilities. We can do a better job. 
One, one thing I might add to that, the, I, I'm trained thoroughly and deeply in science, and the longer I live within the scientific community, the more I realize that many, many scientists and now more and more citizens tend to think of science as somehow strangely different than what science actually is. So science is really a methodology. It's not, it's not necessarily a metaphysics. It starts with premises, but it, it's often overextended. And th there's a corrective power that a general citizenry can have over the a priori assumptions that many scientists start within their profession but extend outward into their policy recommendations. And Phil, you might say something to this because I, I think in, in your paper you, you referenced a certain methods of approach, reductive and analytic approaches, that are then overextended to not just practical matters in, of, of policy but broad social perceptions of the very foundations of human nature, especially reductive notions of, and these will certainly have an important implication for, for our, our general views and our practical applications of principles of justice. Well, I uh, thank you. I'll just make a comment. I know there's another question out here, but I want to make a comment. On it. First of all, I wanted to say how much I think some of the things I was saying really interface with some of the points that Don was making about that recovery and discovery of the human nature of science, the social nature of science. Uh, and uh, we may do it in a little different vocabulary, but what I think that point of emphasizing the, the intentionality in science, the, the, the fact that it begins from self-reflection and so forth, seems to be a very important insight in discovering and, and actually dealing with this question of who are we as humans within the scientific process. So I think that part of it is a very interesting uh, discovery and interface. I think that, uh, and, and, I, and I think where the problem comes is with various forms of reduction. You, you might say naturalism is a methodology of science. It's a necessary methodology of science. Every explanation has certain naturalistic premises. What this becomes very unconsciously, uh, sometimes explicitly, is a kind of metaphysic, a metaphysic about the human being in which I think where it becomes particularly difficult and dangerous in, in many respects is when it is then turned upon the human being themselves. And I think this is in some of the developments in life science where I think that there are developments which are sort of unreflectively being done and essentially develop, impose this kind of reductive metaphysic upon human beings themselves. And that's where I think there needs to be some greater uh, reflection on just what science is and what is the basis of science. What is the nature of the scientific method? Who are the scientific reasoners themselves and, and to what extent they're embedded in knowledge communities, intellectual communities, and so forth? And what does, what's the importance of that in understanding our science and even the, some of the deliveries of science? So I think that there are ways in which we can certainly uh, seem to be reorient some of our thinking about uh, some of these uh, scientific questions without at the same time acknowledging the great power, importance, and contribution of the sciences to our understanding of ourselves, understanding of our world, and understanding even the relationships of peoples and justice and so forth. But I think that there are some ways in which there, there really is some room for some dialogue, and I thought it was interesting that I, I would very strongly re Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, sure. please? Lunch is being served in the lower level dining area. Please make your way there now. Thank you. I think we'll override that and have one more question. Well, in this case, this is sort of a follow-up to uh, Dr. Sloan. Uh, and this is coming on the, uh, from a person who has an interest in and a little bit of study of history of science, but uh, very sporadic in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the things, and you mentioned it uh, in your, your paper, uh, that surprises me about the overall development of the life sciences is the degree to which teleology both exists and hangs on for so long. Uh, you mentioned Linnaeus, I mean, you can even see it in Newton in some ways, but uh, of course with Darwin you're talking something else. And when it comes to Darwin, a lot of people tend to look upon social Darwinism as being an aberration 
And based on my reading of his works, again, as a non-specialist, that's not an aberration. It's really more a logical conclusion in a lot of ways. So in the current, you, you've talked a lot about current debates and things. Are there any movements afoot to resurrect some form of teleology? Because yeah, I, I, a better defense of, of human I, I think I know where you're going. Let me just answer that because I think that's an important question and I didn't, just the limits of time didn't allow me to develop a whole section, which I would have. I think there's some very interesting developments within life science itself taking place, imminent de developments. And one of those is the development of sy systems theory in biology and the, and, and the concerns with dynamic systems and the reintroduction with that, uh, often under different vocabulary, of teleological principles. So we have people talking about robustness and, and uh, concepts like this, that if you're a traditional Aristotelian Thomist, you see there's a certain kind of translation that can be done between these concepts. And so, and they, they, the whole conception of organismic biology, which has been, for various reasons, <coughs> historical reasons, <coughs> eliminated or at least dampened within the biological science for a long period of time. I think that's coming back in again, uh, e what they call evo evil, e evolutionary developmental uh, e interpretations of evolutionary theory. There's a lot of things coming back in that I think make some options for, you know, a more robust development of teleological principles. That could be interesting. Uh, Father Nicanor uh, Ostriakov, if you've read any of his works or seen it present, he's a molecular biologist uh, who has been developing on this. and. Uh, I can give you some further references, but I think <clears throat> there is, a, he's a person that's been exploring this a lot, interfacing traditional Catholic philosophy and systems biology, and I think there's some interesting dimensions there. So I do think there's some options here that uh, certainly are coming up within the sciences and not simply being imposed from without, and I think that's important to see that. All right, I guess we have to end, but just in closing, um, it's interesting to reflect on how this word justice is used um, in a variety of ways, and one of the ways is in carpentry, right? They, you justify, it means to sort of look, properly locate, um, rectify, and align things. So ours is, a, is has some analogy here. We're going to need to take these, these uh, varied dimensions of perspective, the ethical, the legal, and the uh, evidences of science and bring them together to forge a, a, a positive f forward future for our civilization. I want to thank our, our panelists for a very interesting and engaging and thoughtful for a set of presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you.